Welcome everyone to today's webinar. This webinar is the second in our series of clinical trial webinars, and I'm happy to have you joining us today. As you know, there are many clinical trials currently enrolling PWS patients for their studies. Some of these trials are investigational drugs, others are behavioral interventions. A list of trials is available on fpwr.org, and I encourage you to visit this site to learn more about the opportunities that are available. Our community has been waiting a long time for these treatment opportunities, and we are fortunate to have so many opportunities available to us this year. I know that you're joining us today because you want treatments for your loved one, and these trials are the first step. In order to bring any treatment to market, we need to enroll these trials so that they can collect the data necessary to show efficacy for the FDA. It will require the effort of the entire PWS community to help complete these trials, and I encourage you to learn more about these opportunities and to determine which opportunity may be right for you and your family. Today's guest presenters are from Soleno Therapeutics, and they'll be sharing more information with you regarding their phase three study of DCCR. This stands for Diazoxide Choline Controlled Release Tablet. We will be collecting questions from the audience throughout the webinar and will answer all of your questions after their short presentation. Without further delay, I give you the team from Soleno Therapeutics. Thank you, Susan, for inviting us to provide an overview of our Destiny PWS study to the members of the PWS community. I am Anish Patnagar, CEO of Soleno Therapeutics, which is a biotech company located in Redwood City, California. Uh, we're focused on the development and commercialization of novel therapeutics for the treatment of rare diseases. And our lead candidate is Dizoxide Choline Controlled Release, or DCCR, which is a once daily oral tablet for the treatment of PWS. Our ongoing phase three study is Destiny PWS, which stands for DCCR Efficacy and Safety Trial in Young Children and Adults with PWS. I'm joined by my colleagues today, uh, Dr. Neil Cowan, Senior Vice President for Drug Development, and Kristen Yen, Head of Clinical Operations, as well as Dr. Parisa Salehi, who is the Principal Investigator at Seattle Children's Hospital. I'll start by asking uh, Neil Cowan to provide some background on DCCR. Neil? Thank you. Next slide, please. Thanks, Anish. Uh, I'd like to provide you with some background on DCCR. Appetite is controlled by two sets of neurons in the region of the brain called the hypothalamus, which controls certain metabolic processes in the body. The NPY AGRP neurons increase appetite. POMC neurons decrease appetite. Research shows that due to the deletion of SNORD-116, one of the genes in the prader willi critical region on chromosome 15, the function of neurons involved in stimulating appetite is increased in PWS. These increases are likely what drives hyperphagia. The neurons that increase appetite and decrease appetite have channels called KTP channels, and DCCR opens the KTP channels in these neurons, thereby reducing appetite and hyperphagia. Next slide, please. DCCR is a once daily tablet formulation of diazoxide choline, which is the choline salt of diazoxide and breaks down into diazoxide that is then absorbed from the gut. Diazoxide has a long history of safe use. It was approved by the FDA in 1976 and has been in use since then in patients for which it is approved. So the safety profile of diazoxide is well known. It's used for the treatment of low blood sugar due to increased insulin levels in infants, children, and adults in very rare conditions known as hyperinsulinism and insulinoma. The oral suspension is usually taken two to three times per day and normally a daily dose is up to several times higher than the doses that are being evaluated in PWS. In the development of DCCI, there's been no new safety findings compared to diazoxide. The most common adverse effects are increased blood sugar and peripheral swelling, both of which can be managed by your doctor. It's worth noting that the doses of DCCI used in this study are at the low end or below the range used for diazoxide. DCCR has preclinical and clinical data supporting its safety. To date, eight clinical trials have been conducted using DCCR, and over 100, 210 healthy volunteers and subjects with obesity, hypertriglyceridemia, and prader willi patients have been treated in these studies. Next slide, please. 
The study of DCCR in 13 overweight and obese PWS patients aged 10 to 22 was conducted at the University of California, Irvine. In this study, subjects treated with DCCR showed significant improvements in hyperphagia. In addition, there was a significant decrease in body fat mass and waist circumference consistent with the loss of visceral fat, and a significant increase in lean body mass. There was also a significant reduction in aggressive behaviors. It's worth noting that the subjects who were treated with higher doses showed greater beneficial effects, such as improvements in hyperphagia, decreases in body fat, and increases in lean body, body mass or muscle mass. The adverse events reported in this study were consistent with the adverse events or effects that were expected from diazoxide. This pilot study helped drive the design of the DCCI development program. Next slide. Thank you, Neil. Um, I would like uh, to now introduce uh, Dr. Parisa Salehi, who is a pediatric endocrinologist at Seattle Children's Hospital and a principal investigator on this study. Dr. Salehi was the first investigator to enroll a patient in the Destiny PWS study. She now has several patients enrolled in the study and is one of our top enrollers. She also has subjects enrolled in the Open Label Extension study, and she's going to provide you with details about the Destiny PWS study as well as the extension study. Dr. Salehi. Thank you, Anish. And also thank you to the FPWR for inviting me to speak about the Destiny PWS study. It's really nice to see a potential option for PWS patients, which not only affect their hyperphagia, but also may affect other aspects of the disease. Um, this program consists of two studies, C601, the Destiny PWS study, which is a multi-center, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, parallel arm study in patients with PWS, um, which is a phase three study. Then we have six. O2, which is an open label safety extension study. In the C601 study, the plan is to enroll about 100 patients at approximately 25 sites. Eligible subjects will be in the study for approximately 15 weeks. This is double blind. It also is placebo controlled, which means that some subjects will not receive DCCR, but will receive placebo, which means that the tablet containing um, sorry, the tablet does not contain any drug. The assignment to DCCR or placebo is random, like rolling a die or flipping a coin. Subjects have a two out of three chance in being assigned to DCCR and a one out of three chance of being assigned to placebo. Subjects will undergo a titration phase during which their doses will be increased every two weeks until they reach their maintenance dose. In total, there will be seven visits in the study where the first six visits are every two weeks, then there are five weeks in between the last two visits. At the end of the study visit, subjects who have successfully completed C601 are eligible to enroll into C602. C602 is then a nine-month open-label safety study. In C602, all subjects will receive DCCR. Next slide, please. The primary objective of this study is to evaluate the effects of DCCR compared to placebo on hyperphagia in PWS patients. This is being evaluated using a hyperphagia questionnaire. One of the secondary objectives is to evaluate changes in body fat mass. The body fat mass will be measured using a DEXA scanner, which is an x-ray procedure to measure body fat mass as well as lean body mass or muscle. Two other secondary objectives are to evaluate the clinical global impression of improvement or the CGII and the caregiver global impression of change or the GIC. The clinical global impression of improvement is a question that the study doctor will answer and the caregiver global impression of change is a question that the caregiver will answer. Additional objectives of this study are to assess safety as well as the effect of DCCR compared to placebo on body composition parameters, BMI, waist circumference, lipid parameters, subjects' health-related quality of life, caregiver burden, and PWS behaviors. Next slide, please. So what are the key eligibility criteria for this study? Um, key inclusion criteria, 
does include being able to provide voluntary written informed consent from the parent or the legal guardian of the patient, as well as provide voluntary written assent um, from the patient as appropriate. You must have genetically confirmed prader willi syndrome and be hyperphagic. You must be four years of age and older. You must be in a stable care setting for at least six months prior to visit one and be on stable regimens of medications for at least three months prior to visit one. Some criteria that might exclude you from being in the study include having a weight less than 30 kilograms or less than 66 pounds, or having a weight greater than 135 kilograms or greater than 297 pounds. Also, if you've participated in another interventional clinical study within three months of visit one, that will also exclude you. Although there might be an amendment um, in the next protocol where this will be shortened to 60 days of, in, sorry, 60 days before visit one. Um, if you've ever had any history of allergic reaction to diazoxide, thiazides, or sulfonamide, this will also exclude you from being in the study, as well as a history of blood clots. There is also a list of some prohibited medications that you can't use within three months of visit one. These include drugs that might affect weight loss or any of the study endpoints. If you've ever been on systemic steroids within three months of visit one, so that includes, you know, steroids for asthma or some other condition like that. If you've used insulin within three months, any medication that affects metabolism of the study drug or any other investigational drugs. Next slide, please. Now, what can you expect at these study visits? The duration of participation is 15 weeks with seven visits. Visits one through six are two weeks apart. Visits six and seven are five weeks apart. At every visit, we do monitor for safety. Subjects will have a safety, a safety um, questionnaire by the physician or the study coordinator, a physical exam, which will include a peripheral edema assessment and a thromboembolic assessment. Subjects will need to fast for at least eight hours prior to every visit for fasting blood tests. At some visits, there will be questionnaires for the caregiver to complete an ECG at visits one, six, and seven, a DEXA scan at visits two and seven, a urine test at visits two, four, six, and seven, as well as diet, physical activity, and sleep assessments at visits two through seven. Next slide, please. This map shows where the sites are in the US. There are 12 sites that are currently recruiting subjects and four sites that will soon be recruiting. There will be more sites coming soon. Clinicaltrials.gov, as well as the FPWR website, list the sites that are actively recruiting subjects. If you have any questions about sites or if your um, site um, or if your area is not um, available as a site, please contact the Seleno project manager at the phone number or email provided. Thank you, Dr. Saleh. I believe, Susan, we can take some questions now. Yes, we're going to open up the lines to questions. You can submit a question by finding the question header in your control panel and typing a question in the box and submitting it. We will do our best to answer all questions that have been submitted. And we do have a couple here that are waiting in the queue. The first question that we have is, is there any documentation that shows that DCCR works? Yes, in fact, uh, there, has a, there has been a pilot study in patients with PWS, which was conducted at uh, UC Irvine Medical Center. And in that study, DCCR showed significant improvements in hyperphagia, significant decreases in body fat mass and waist circumference, consistent with the loss of visceral fat and also a significant increase in lean body mass. This is based on DEXA scanning. Uh, a number of posters and presentations have been done at national and international conferences that describe the safety and potential effectiveness of DCCR in patients with PWS. And a number of these are available on our website, which is www.seleno.life. How, um, perhaps you could tell us, how have subjects been doing so far in this study? Have you seen any improvements? 
So as we had noted earlier, the ongoing Destiny PWS study is a double-blind placebo-controlled study with a third of patients receiving placebo. We do not know which patients are on DCCR and which ones are on placebo. So we're not really able to say whether improvements have been seen or not at this time, I'm afraid. Our next question, uh, how is this DCCR different from the diazoxide that's already available? That's a really good question. Uh, diazoxide choline controlled release, or DCCR, is not the same as diazoxide. Diazoxide choline is a crystalline salt form of diazoxide, which allows it to be made into a tablet form, which in turn allows for a slow release of diazoxide choline and absorption of diazoxide. Think of it as a tablet that releases small amounts of diazoxide choline over 24 hours in the gut. In contrast, uh, the currently available disoxide formulation is an immediate release formulation, meaning that it more rap it's more rapidly absorbed and then cleared from the body. So it needs to be taken two to three times a day. DCCR is an extended release formulation, so it's absorbed over a longer time, and it allows us to dose the medication once daily. The tablets, DCCR tablets, also allow for consistency of dosing, which is difficult to achieve with an oral suspension of diazoxide. Uh, we expect that DCCR may be safer and may have a lower number and severity of side effects due to the ability to dose at lower levels while still achieving a therapeutic effect. That, however, needs to be confirmed in the clinical trials that we are now conducting. What side effects might participants need to be watching for? So the most common side effects that have been seen in previous studies and the use of disoxide in its current indication are increased blood sugar and peripheral edema, which is, think of it as fluid retention or swelling. In most cases, we expect these to be short-term and self-limited. If needed, uh, the doctor can lower the DCCR dose or stop treatment temporarily to treat those, but we expect that to be infrequent. Uh, we have seen that in the past, uh, disoxide, when it's used as um, without titration, which means uh, we directly dose with a high dose of disoxide, there used to be more side effects. Uh, with the current dosing paradigm of disoxide, it is uh, DCCR is much better tolerated. Uh, does this medication interact with a person's blood sugar? Does it increase or decrease those levels? And and if so, are these going to be monitored throughout the 15 weeks? So theoretically, it can impact blood sugar because it does decrease the insulin secretion temporarily. However, what we have seen so far is that these effects tend to be temporary. Uh, in the studies that we are conducting, uh, we allow either patients who are not diabetic or patients who are diabetic on treatment without insulin, though, to be admitted into the study. And what we have seen so far and we expect to see is that there may be a transient increase in glucose, but over time with continued dosing with DCCR, the levels should come back to normal. Uh, and that's kind of our expectation with DCCR. Can you describe in layman's term, I know Dr. Um, Salahi did a great job going through each visit but could you talk a little bit more about what a person, you know, how long will a visit last and what some of these tests mean? So in total, as Dr. Salehi said, there are seven visits in total within the 15 weeks in this study. And most of these visits are lasting about two to two and a half hours on average. However, the screening and randomization and end of study visits may last up to about four hours. You know, I was just saying that uh, some of the, the evaluations that uh, Dr. Salehi was talking about, such as uh, a DEXA scan, think of it as a simple X-ray of the whole body that takes just a few minutes and doesn't really require any um, particular involvement from a patient. A number of the other evaluations are just questionnaires. Uh, typically, they are either filled out by the caregiver who's accompanying the patient or by the physician. Um, there is blood work to be done, and uh, it varies by which visit. Um, in some visits, there's more blood work. In others, there's less. In, in regards to the blood work, um, Dr. Salahi had mentioned that 
fasting needed to take place for eight hours prior. Are these appointments then scheduled for the morning so that our children or, or loved ones are able to um, fast overnight? Yes, um, all the sites will make an attempt to schedule the visits as early as possible in the morning to ensure that uh, the fasting bloods can be obtained. And I also wanted to complete an answer from uh, one of your prior questions, which was, is blood sugar evaluated on a regular basis for these 15 weeks? And the answer is yes. Blood sugar is carefully evaluated for these 15 weeks. There, there's a question regarding the... Um or the availability of drug. Is there an open label extension where where parents can continue to um, participate with their loved one and, and will have access to drug during that time? Yes, as Dr. Salehi mentioned, once uh, a patient completes the three month uh, randomized double blind placebo control study, uh, they have the ability to, own, uh, to enroll into a nine month safety extension study. And this is a study in which everyone will get drug. So the total duration of treatment could be as much as one year. Could you provide more information on what the monitoring looks like in that open label nine month period? Right, so that is, uh, think of it more as a safety extension study. So we don't do such extensive evaluations in the study. Uh, so it's a simpler version of the randomized double blind study. The visits uh, after the first few weeks are much less frequent and the number of evaluations are much less as well. Uh, we are working on simplifying that protocol further and we expect to see the number of visits to be quite infrequent after the first few weeks in that protocol. We have several questions regarding eligibility um, around the weight requirements um, as well as hyperphagia. So to go, to go through these questions, the first one is, you know, my child is old enough to participate but weighs less than 30 kilograms and he clearly has hyperphagia. Why can't, why can't my child enroll? Yes, it's a really good question. Um, the, the answer really is because of the fact that the optimal dose of DCCR is in a certain range based on body weight. So think of it as a milligram per kilogram. Uh, we ha currently have specific tablet strengths that are available, which could make the dose too high for patients who are lighter than 30 kgs. So we are working on lower dose strengths right now, and we plan to update the protocol once those are available. And conversely, if the patient is above 135 kgs, um, the challenge is that the specific dose strengths are such that it would make the doses too low for patients who are heavy, heavier than 135. In addition, on the higher end, we would also like to limit the dose to what's been used in studies so far so that we continue to be comfortable with the safety of DCCR in the study. Then this, this is the second question in regards to, to weight. Um, the, the question is, you know, if my child's height and weight are normal, is he or she still eligible? Correct. There is no exclusion for anyone with normal height or weight. Uh, the exclusion really is that the patients must weigh either above 30 kgs or below 135 to be eligible. And obviously, they must meet the other eligibility criteria as well. But uh, in response to the question, the patients do not need to be obese or have a high BMI to be enrolled at the study. You showed us a list earlier of, um, I'm actually going to go back to the sites that are currently enrolling or getting ready to enroll. Um, one, of our, one of our audience members is saying that there's not, a, there's not a trial site near where they're at in Chicago. Is there um, the possibility of having a site in that area or is there travel funds to help get to one of these other sites? So we, we are actively trying to uh, recruit more sites um, who are interested in participating. So I would actually encourage um, anyone who is uh, seeing a, a physician in the Chicago area to ask if they're interested. We're happy to open a site in the area. However, until such time, uh, we would be happy to support the travel of anyone who would want to go to the nearest site, which is not in their area. And what is covered in those um, when when you when you facilitate travel? Will will that cover transportation, lodging expenses? 
So, um, yes, the reimbursement, there is reimbursement available for each visit, and it does cover lodging and other travel expenses, as well as meals. So, how, if there's not a site close to a person, what should they do? How do they pick a site? So, it may be easiest to pick the geographically closest site and uh, call the, the contact information that's listed uh, at clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, the study coordinators uh, are very responsive, and um, they will be able to talk, the, talk you through how to best do it. Um, if you have any problems with that, uh, this the Saleno project manager is always available to help you, and that contact information is also on one of the slides. Thank you. We're starting to get a lot of questions about specific regions where there's currently not trials being planned. Do you have a timeline for when we might know where more sites are going to be available? We are actively, uh, I would say we are active at 12 sites right now, and those are listed on the slides. Uh, I believe there's four or five additional sites um, that we are hoping to start, hopefully in the next few weeks. And as I said, if there are specific geographies, uh, we're happy to look at them for other sites. Uh, but remember, though, that uh, it does take time to get a site up and running. So it may be most practical for um, someone to actually look at their closest sites geographically and uh, be enrolled there. And uh, as Kristen mentioned, we do provide a travel assistant, et cetera, so that should uh, be able to facilitate uh, their participation. In regards to um, ex current medications, if someone's on growth hormone, does that preclude them from participating? It does not. Um, um, patients in our prior study, uh, a good proportion of them were on growth hormone as well and we do not expect to have any detrimental effect of DCCR on growth hormone or vice versa. This is a tablet. How big is this tablet? And have patients had any problems taking it? We have not had any concern expressed by patients or sites to date. Uh, this was a, a topic of conversation as we uh, designed the study, et cetera. Uh, there are two strengths of tablets available. The smaller one is probably the size of an Advil. Uh, the larger one is probably uh, about uh, two times that or so. So these are not very large tablets. And as I said, we have not heard any concerns so far uh, from patients in terms of swallowing them. Just as a reminder, these tablets do need to be swallowed whole. They should not be chewed because this is an extended release product and it's important that they be swallowed. We have one um, question asking if this medication impacts any specific organs like the kidneys or liver. There is no evidence to suggest that uh, DCCR has any detrimental effects on the liver or kidney, etc. However, we are studying that, we are closely following that, and the reason we do this blood work is to ensure that that is the case. Um, but there is no evidence to suggest uh, that uh, it detrimentally impacts any of the uh, vital organs. Um, speaking of long-term use, is there any data so far that supports that this drug continues to work after three or, or six months? Um, the, the, this, this person, the, the um, audience member, is, is saying that it seems like her son gets used to medications after a while and they lose their efficacy. What does the data on this drug show? Does it seem to have a long-term efficacy? It's a very good question. Um, as is probably obvious to you, DCCR has not been studied for long-term treatment in PWS patients. However, there is an interesting uh, data set that can be looked at to, to see if uh, patients develop tolerance or not. This drug, as uh, Neil mentioned, was first approved in 1976 uh, for the treatment of uh, rare conditions. It's currently used for treating hyperinsulinism and patients with insulinoma. And uh, these are patients who stay on dizoxide for very long periods of time, years at a time. 
and it remains the standard of care for many of those patients. So if that is any gauge, we should not expect to see tolerance develop, but we do not have the specific data in PWS at this time. Let's talk about anxiety. A lot of our community members, their loved ones experience high levels of anxiety. Have you seen or measured any changes in anxiety with PCCR? So as part of this study, we are measuring a number of behaviors. As you know, the, the FPWR has a very substantial series of questions that are asked as part of the PWS profile questionnaire, and that will be administered as part of the study. So we don't have any definitive data on the effect on anxiety at this time. Uh, what we saw in the earlier study was an effect on aggressive, destructive behaviors, but we hope to know a lot more at the end of this uh, study. We have some um, enrollment timeline questions. Will all participants start and end at the same time, or is this an open rolling enrollment where I can start as soon as my site is ready to enroll me? Uh, it's the latter. So it is a rolling enrollment in the sense that uh, not all patients will start at the same time. Uh, there are several patients who have started, and uh, we expect that patients will continue to enroll probably over the next. Uh, a handful of months, um, but yes, it is a rolling enrollment. Is there a deadline for when people need to be enrolled by? We don't have a definitive date for completion of enrollment, but um, we are currently enrolling at uh, 12 different sites. Uh, new sites are coming on board quite rapidly. So um, I expect that we should be uh, completing enrollment in the not too distant future. I would encourage patients to reach out to their closest sites as soon as possible. Well, thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to thank our audience for coming and joining us and learning more about the DCCR study. Additional information on this study as well as others can be found on the fpwr.org website as well as clinicaltrials.gov. We do have more upcoming trial webinars, and these are all listed on the FJBR website. We hope you will continue to join us and learn more about these important opportunities. We hope to see you again soon. Have a great day.